us to talk a little bit about food defense, uh, food outbreaks and regulatory out, uh, actions, and then product recalls and some of the impacts from product recalls. We're kind of starting at the back end. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the impact at the federal inspected establishment. Most of my focus will be on meat and poultry uh, because that's where my experience has been. And we'll talk a little bit about FDA regulated products, just minor, uh, because I know most of you work with the production animals and on the live animal side. So, but we'll touch a little bit about some of those impacts more broadly. So. Emer emergency preparedness and response. Um, obviously, the federal reg regulatory agencies have a role in that, and I see APHIS is represented in the room. Uh, and they're going to focus on the live animal side, and FSIS is going to focus on the um, regulatory um, role on the establishments, which is where I spent my time, as you heard, for 17 years. And they're going to come together and work when there is a situation such as BSE, AI, or an animal disease outbreak where those animals would then be presented to the regulated establishment. So there's times that those regulatory agencies work together. And when we talk about food defense, I thought it'd be good to have a common definition, a common platform. Um, and we're really talking about those measures that you would have in place to reduce um, someone intentionally contaminating the food anywhere along the continuum so that the food supply would not kill or hurt people, or more importantly, disrupt our economy, or even ruin our business. And I put some pictures up because I thought about some of the scenarios that I've run into, whether I was at FSIS or whether I've been in my current job, to depict some of the things that I think about uh, when we get calls where I currently work. I think every good law firm ought to have a veterinarian. Don't you all agree? Um, and we get calls where people have had um, employees making threats. We get calls where there's somebody showing up at the security desk pretending to be somebody they're not. Um, and I put this pig up there with his nose sticking out. Um, and I'm sure my colleague at APHIS will remember, perhaps he was at the same exercise. The idea that when pigs are in transportation, so all of you in your jobs, whether you're a veterinarian or a producer, Animals leave the farm, and they're en route to go be slaughtered, and we stop at a rest stop. How more vulnerable could we be than pigs sticking their nose out of the side of a truck? And somebody has access to foot and mouth disease in a syringe or another disease. And then those animals continue in transport. It's a huge vulnerability for us. So we probably have good procedures, food uh, biosecurity measures at our farms. And plants have good measures at the facilities. But what's happening as the animals go from one place to the next? So things to think about. And I think it's really important to understand that an attack at a particular establishment could be carried out by an extremist group we all think about that, but it could also be a disgruntled employee like I talked about. It might be a minor event, and if that food got into commerce, let's think about what happened yesterday at the Boston Marathon. Within seconds, for those of you on Twitter or your kids are on Twitter, it became a national and then an international event very quickly, didn't it? So even if a disgruntled employee decided to be angry at their employer and walk in that day and say, I'm mad at my employer today, and put razor blades into the packages of ground beef, and it makes it into commerce, you're thinking, that doesn't affect me. I raise pigs, or I work with people that raise pigs. Let's say they put it into sausage. As soon as that goes out into commerce and somebody gets that, all of a sudden it's affecting pork, pork production, pork supply, can affect us internationally. There was an intentional contamination of pork, and you better believe if that was intentional, it can impact every one of you in this room. It can Im impact our ability to trade, because once that gets on Twitter, Facebook, and into the international community, one plant 
can affect all of us. And it happens very quickly. So FSIS has worked with the regulated industry to put together food defense plans. And they've come up with the areas that they believe are most vulnerable, the nodes that they think are most vulnerable. And they recommend, they're not mandatory like food safety programs, but they recommend that the industry look at these areas as the vulnerable areas and then address them in a way that's appropriate for their facility. When I was at FSIS, I always talked to the industry and I shared the story that when I went to the 14th Street Market in New York, uh, and there are plants on the 14th Street Market in New York City, that when I drove through the fence to do pre-op at 3 o'clock in the morning, and that fence opened and locked behind me, I was glad to have that fence. It was not a place I felt safe by myself at 3 o'clock in the morning. That fence was providing security for that plant. When I was in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, doing pre-op at 3 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, I was the threat. I would often just show up unannounced. I would like to go and see my employees and let them know I cared about them. And I would go at 3 o'clock in the morning, and when I show up in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, I'm a stranger. Why are you here? Who are you? Can you identify yourself? Do you have a badge? I was the threat. They probably didn't need a fence with a locked gate because they knew when individuals that were not intended to be there showed up. So outside security is really important, but you have to gauge where you're at. So each plant needs to look at that and make it appropriate for their own facility. So FSIS has come up with a document that each plant can fill out, go through the checklist, and then when they're done with it, they can have a food defense plan. But if they don't use it and implement it and actually have countermeasures that they're using, it's a document. So they actually have to have an implemented food defense plan for it to be meaningful. But they do give them the tools necessary to get there. They actually have something called a food defense tool on their website that you can actually go in and go to the areas, select your steps and they will actually give you suggested countermeasures. It's not really a complex notion. These are the countermeasures that would work uh, and they give you a lot of ideas on their website. There are transportation guidelines, disposal guidelines, and FDA just last week put out FDA tools. Uh, I said I was going to mention FDA briefly. In the Food Safety Modernization Act and the proposed rule, food defense is mandatory. I mentioned it was voluntary for FSIS. It is mandatory for FDA. So again, there's the model food defense plans. Uh, and most importantly, I would say FSIS does encourage plants to have them. But they do feel strongly that plants that are controlling for food safety likely are controlling for food defense. And in the event we talked about product was shipped, uh, those plants would have in place the necessary steps to recover that product. Because whether it's intentionally contaminated or not intentionally contaminated, once it's shipped and in commerce, the mechanism to recover it's the same. That plant would be expected to recall that product. So I'm going to step aside from that because I'm going to talk about recalls at the end. But I think it's clear that a plant that has shipped product, whether it's intentionally adulterated or not, would have to get that back from commerce, right? We wouldn't want it out causing people harm. And I think it's also important to understand that that individual plant, well, they would have to address getting that product back from commerce. I talked about the Twitter and the Facebook and the news. Our regulatory agencies have a great system and a great network in place. We have Homeland Security now, we have APHIS, we have USDA, and they would take over if there's credible threats, doing the communication and the appropriate actions when there's credible threats or a credible attack on our food supply. So each plant is dealing with it on the individual level, and our regulatory agencies are doing their job from the higher level. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So we go if I set recalls to the side for a moment, and we'll talk about those after we've talked about outbreaks. Okay. So how many of you have seen these kind of maps? Seen them on the news, seen them on CDC's webpage, looked at them with um, a client perhaps. So the colored states is where there have been cases of foodborne illness. And this is from the CDC webpage. So FSIS would work with CDC in the case of a foodborne outbreak. FSIS does not have the primary responsibility. And I think you're going to hear a lot from Dr. Calloway Edwards about the regulated establishment's role in outbreaks because it's not going to come back to the regulated establishment until there's a lot of cases uh, and the CDC has worked to identify the food that might be implicated in an outbreak. So CDC is out there looking to see, ah, there's a large number of people on that map, a dark green state. What is the problem? So FSIS works with that entire public health community, and when they're notified, they would work to identify the source of production. So CDC might come to them and say, we have 45 people, We've interviewed them, and we believe meat has caused these people to be ill. In interviewing them, many of them have identified they've had hamburger in the last 25 days. So FSIS then would say, did they identify where they ate the hamburger from? Well, yes, they ate the hamburger, and it came from Illinois, and several of them said they ate it from establishment XYZ. So then FSIS has a responsibility of looking at establishment XYZ to see what's happening at establishment XYZ. So that's how FSIS would get involved in an outbreak response. They would look at the source of production, the suspect meat or poultry product. Um, they would look to see if there's factors that were contributing when they went to the plant. Uh, was there a breakdown in production? Did the establishment have positive product from their own testing results? Did FSIS have positives in their testing results? Uh, and they would make recommendations based on their current policies. But they would do it in this case based on what was happening with, FD, uh, with the CDC. As you can tell, this is not an immediate type action. CDC has an outbreak, a significant number of cases. They've gone to FSIS. They had to identify a plant. We're talking weeks, sometimes months before that could happen. FSIS may take, have to take samples. They might have to do an in-depth investigation. They may not be able to identify the particular establishment. Maybe CDC says, we have all these cases and they're coming from the Northwest. So you might have seen a public health alert where FSIS did not even identify an establishment but said, we caution people from eating uh, undercooked, um, frozen ready to eat, um, frozen not ready to eat chicken products. Um, and we issued a public health alert. Uh, and that would do that if they couldn't identify the particular product that was causing people to get sick, but had enough concern, uh, because there was enough cases, to alert people to make sure they were cooking that product properly. They might, if they could identify the particular plant, ask them to recall that product. And they might also take enforcement action. But these things take time under those circumstances. And this is whether it's intentional or non-intentional contamination. Another way to get to an outbreak response would be if FSIS is conducting their own testing, and they conducted four pathogens, um, adulterants. They look at ready-to-eat products for listeria, for example. They look at raw ground beef for 0157 and non-0157. And if they find those organisms, they would consider the product adulterated. And they may also have heard from CDC that they're looking at an outbreak. And these things can come together a lot more quickly. And in that case, they would ask that product to be recalled. They also conduct process control testing. And I want to talk about this one a little bit because I think it gives us a model to talk about some animal health issues, which I know are of interest to you all. FSIS conducts salmonella testing on raw products. They would collect somewhere between 51 and 53 samples in an ongoing way, one a day, 
and they're looking to see if that establishment is in, within the window of what they would consider to be process control. They don't hold the sample. They don't take any regulatory action. That product goes out into commerce. It is not an adulterant that they're looking for. However, if at any point they hear from CDC that people are sick with salmonella, so we go back to my original scenario, and CDC came to FSIS and said, we have an outbreak. It is in Kentucky. People are eating product from establishment ABC in Kentucky. And it is with Salmonella, Heidelberg, and poultry. And FSIS went to establishment ABC. And they were able to determine production date February 15th through February 20th were the particular production dates. They would ask that establishment to remove product from February 15th to February 20th because they could find a particular production date that was causing people to be ill and they would ask for it to be removed from commerce. When I worked at FSIS, I was often asked to explain this to people that didn't really understand epidemiology and I would bring Hershey Kisses. And I would say if the sick people and the product and the production dates lead back to a particular establishment, so the Hershey Kisses or the Epi curve line up, FSIS can ask for a recall. But only if none of those Hershey Kisses are out of line. So the Epi curve has to be direct between the illnesses and a particular production of product. So you will see an occasional recall. I think we saw one a couple summers ago for a large amount of poultry from an establishment. Raw poultry, raw ground poultry for salmonella. And many people were going, I don't recall this being an adulterant. More interestingly, FSIS is looking at if there's multiple production days implicated, they're starting to say, wow, when we go into those plants, all of their interventions are working. They're not having issues with zero tolerance, so they're not having contamination. It must be coming from where? What do you guys do? Pre-harvest, on farm. Must be coming into the plant with the birds, right? So FSIS is starting to ask that question. I mean, they're not saying it is, but they don't know that it isn't. So they're asking that question. And a question I would have is if that's true, what would the break point be? So if I had a recall from February 15th to Feb February 20th because I knew that was a production date at an establishment, what live animal dates would have gone into that? That would vary depending on a processing establishment, wouldn't it? Could be very considerable depending on how they grind, whether they're doing straight breast, whether they're bringing in outside meat. It could vary greatly, couldn't it, depending on the establishment. So FSIS is asking that question. And it's also unclear to me what steps the grower can take to break that contamination especially if it's for a particular serotype. And if you all know how to break a particular serotype of salmonella, please see me when I walk out of the room because I want that answer. And I will tell you the regulated industry will pay largely for that answer because they don't know how to take salmonella Heidelberg and eliminate it. And they'd love to know. And I say this could be a model for animal disease outbreaks and recalls. So we're looking at salmonella, but I'd ask you, what if it was AI? I don't believe AI. I think the science shows it doesn't transfer from animal to meat, right? But I do believe if the animals came to a regulated establishment, the question would be asked, didn't it come from the animal to the establishment? Because I don't think our consumers out there are going to say, hey, I don't care, I'm going to cook it anyway. 
how many of you believe if we have an AI outbreak next week that federal establishments are going to be able to freely ship birds from AI positive for flocks? So either you're not listening or you agree with me that consumers would be a little concerned. I don't think it's a concern in the meat, but I think our consumers would question it, right? Even though we have science to say it's okay, I don't think they're going to be okay if you stand up there and say, but the science says it's okay. So the question's going to become, where do we break it at the flock? APHIS is going to help us put their boxes around, right? But the question's going to be calm. Does Salmonella start serving as a model for us? Okay? So I just challenge you to look at that. And I do challenge anybody that has an answer for Salmonella because you're a large group of animal producers. Please see me afterwards because we're certainly looking for it. So there's something I would give you to think about. Questions on that? Yes. question is, isn't that where the salmonella is coming from to start with? And wouldn't you detect that in your processing steps? And so I would answer that two ways. A, I don't think salmonella spontaneously generates. So yes, I believe likely it would be coming in with the birds. And so traditionally a processor has said in their hazard analysis, most of them, it's likely to occur, and I'm going to control it with, you know, good dressing practices and this intervention and that intervention. And so now FSIS is going in and saying, well, look, they did control it with this and this and this and this. So now I guess we need to go back to the farm and figure out how to do that. But we don't have that authority. And so far, APHIS hasn't said, we'll go out there and regulate on the farm because we think all the answers are there. So FSIS is trying to figure out how a regulated establishment can be held accountable in their HACCP plan because the HACCP reg says before, during, and after. So they're trying to put the onus on the regulated establishment to control those hazards before they get to the regulated establishment. So in other words, bring in birds with no salmonella. And you, she raised her eyebrows for those of you that didn't see it. <laughs> and I would raise my eyebrows as well, because that's why I challenged all of you for your help. Does that help answer your question? So they don't want to be, so they don't salmonella comes in No, they're still blaming the establishment, and they think the establishment should do more at the pre-harvest level to make sure it doesn't come in. And so the challenge to the regulated establishment from FSIS is, so fix it at pre-harvest. And so far, I'm not aware what different can happen at pre-harvest, but FSIS is basically saying, we believe something different could, and the regulation for HACCP says before, during, and after. So fix it. And we don't care what it takes, but fix it. And that's why I challenged all of you to meet me outside, because a regulated industry would love that answer. And if you have it, you can make it. You don't have to sleep. You can go party tonight, because you're going to be a millionaire tomorrow. <laughs> help? Does that help? Anybody see it differently that's worked on the FSIS side or heard from any of your colleagues that are working in the allied industry? Okay. So I promised I'd get to product recalls, and all of this feeds into product recalls, because whether it's intentional, non-intentional, um, outbreak, uh, if that product makes it into commerce, then the expected response from the regulated agency would be a recall. So as I say, ham and cheese, hold the ham, please. And that impacts all of us in the room, right? So obviously a recall is just the action to remove that product from commerce. Um, FSIS, it is voluntary. I use that term loosely. Um, FSIS does not have mandatory recall authority. Um, but certainly if an establishment chose not to recall adulterated product, FSIS would have the ability to detain that product if it was adulterated and then take that establishment to court 
uh, and ensure that product was safely removed from, com uh, from commerce. Uh, FDA, with the proposed Food Safety Modernization Act, they have put in provisions for mandatory recall. So that's in the proposed rule. Uh, and so far, nobody's refused to take a recall action when there's adulterated product out there, so kudos to the industry. Um, FSIS would propose a recall uh, in the event there's adulterated product out there. Um, and FSIS does post those labels on their website to assist consumers in bringing back the right product. Um, and again, we would expect heightened media, uh, whether it's intentional or non-intentional, but particularly if it's intentional, again, I would let you know, I would expect significantly heightened media uh, if there is intentional contamination. There are news stories every day. Um, you can sign up now on Twitter. Uh, are on your email from both FSIS and FDA to get every recall that comes out on food. Uh, that's how I keep up with them, um, to see what's going on. And you can get all of those emails. Every consumer can get all of those emails. And you can find out what's being recalled every day. Um, I will tell you, I work with a lot of these processors. Cameras will show up at these facilities, even for non-intentional acts. I uh, was at a plant last week. Um, and their process, their recall program actually says that an employee will be fired for talking to a media camera. So most of them have trained their employees, don't talk to the cameras. That's our job, or it's corporate's job. Uh, I don't know that it would be quite this much of a frenzy for a non-intentional act, uh, but it's just a reminder that recalls make the news. A lot of times it's local news, but recalls do make the news. Your uh, product labels are going to appear in the press. Um, and it has an impact on the entire industry. So it's easy to say, oh, it doesn't impact me as a producer, but once you start seeing a recall, it can impact the entire industry. We kind of joke at our firm that the, uh, the pork industry's had it easy, so maybe you all are saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal, uh, but I will tell you uh, that the beef industry would share with you when BSE hit, the entire industry felt it, when there's issues with non-0157, 0157, the entire industry feels it. So the pork industry has had the benefit of, you know, good quality control programs. Not a lot of major pathogens. You've been blessed to have really good opportunities and good programs. But if anything were to hit your industry, you would feel it as a whole. It is not one segment or one processor that feels it. So what are the impacts? What are the lessons learned from others? Uh, certainly there's litigation and settlement, and it's extremely costly. That's typically the one person that had the issue. So this is just um, from a newspaper where there was an outbreak. This happened to be lettuce, protect the guilty. Um, and it was just a settlement action that made the press uh, where there was a settlement, and it was in the sums of million, millions of dollars. Um, and this is bad press. Brad Press, tarnish the brand. Um, I was sharing a story with Lily, uh, just for humor. It was about brand protection. Um, I was going to Pittsburgh, I don't think they'll mind me sharing the story, giving the talk, and the title of my talk was Protecting the Brand. It was just ironic. Um, the stadium name is named after this particular client in Pittsburgh. And they had about a 70-year-old man picking me up in a limousine to take me out to give their keynote speech protecting the brand. And the man says to me when I get in the car, don't change the recipe. Okay. You didn't hear me, ma'am. Don't change the recipe. Okay. He says it about eight more times on the way to my talk. And before I got out, I said, sir, I'm still a little confused. He said, that ketchup. Sir, on your recommendation, I'm not going to change the recipe. He beamed. He had shared with me on the way over there that he and his wife were going to leave Pittsburgh if I changed the recipe. So I prevented he and his wife from moving. I let Hines know that this man cared so strongly about his, their ketchup and the name of their ketchup that he and his wife, who had lived in Pittsburgh maybe a sum total of 160 years, were going to leave the city if I changed the recipe of their ketchup. I was not there to change the recipe of their ketchup, but their brand meant that much to him. So brand is really important, and one recall can take that away from you. So you really have to work to protect your brand. 
It's very costly. Yes, you can get changes to your facility out of it, but on somebody else's timeline and at somebody else's urging, and perhaps not the changes you wanted to make. You're under a microscope. You might have to change personnel, and you might change those personnel at the expense of other changes you had hoped to make. Uh, corporate, um, we have Lily here from JBS, and I think she can tell you uh, that it might be at the expense of other facilities. So if one plant is under a microscope, you might be putting all your energy here rather than having the opportunity to look at many other locations that need to have that um, visibility. So certainly it would be to your benefit to be proactive rather than having to react. And then I'll just kind of end with a little case study um, to close us off. Uh, 2007, I think we all recall what was happening. We had a recall after recall. It just seemed to be the recall year. We had peanuts. We had pistachios. We had peanut butter. We had lettuce. We had cilantro. We had peppers. But more importantly, we had the tipping point. We had a huge outbreak with those that were loved most in our homes, our pets. It was intentional contamination, it was imported, and it hit those that are loved the most in our home. Don't mess with our kids, don't mess with our pets. The melamine recall was the absolute tipping point for food safety and the impacts of food safety. That year, 10 food safety bills were introduced into Congress. Before that, whatever, you can choose what to eat. Your pets can't choose what to eat. Your kids can't choose what to eat. Those 10 food safety bills were finally consolidated. We got the Food Safety Modernization Act. We had regulations come out of it, both on FDA and FSIS side, and we had substantially increased enforcement. So we really need to recognize that when the public gets concerned, and they do get concerned, it impacts what happens on food safety. I would say things do improve. Uh, that was 2007, and you saw there was a lot of concern about food safety. In 2009, we had a repeat of a survey, and people were, again, far more confident. I would say where I see things, you hear me talk about intentional and food defense, I see the vulnerability as kind of that transportation, that in between the processor and the processor. Uh, we have outbreak response. And in that area, I see the federal establishment. As you heard me say, there's a long delay before we get to the federal establishment. And I think that's an area that we have a lot of opportunity and challenge. But I think things do improve. And I think, um, as Matt said, you've got the establishments here talking to you today. And I think that's a really good opportunity to say, we're communicating. And I think that's one of the reasons things do improve, is that we're communicating and we're talking about how we fill these voids and um, we can demonstrate to the public that we have a seamless system and that we're able to fit in and fill any of these opportunities and challenges.